Kak Yoga, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, we have uh, around 60 participants uh, now. Shall we wait maybe for one or two more minutes? Sure, no problem. Thank you. I just would like to ask, are you okay? Sorry, I, you're breaking up. Uh, I, is it clear from my side? And now it's clear. Just now you broke up. What was the uh, question? Are you okay if uh, the participant asked uh, to ask Hello? Yeah. Oh, this. Yeah, legging. Legging. Lagging, is it? Is it okay now, Doctor? Now I can hear you. Can you hear me as I'm talking? Or just uh, mouth movements and... Uh, you are very clear. Okay. How Much about... Better. How about... Is it lagging? No, is now it? I can hear you. You are asking me a question. Is it okay? Uh, is it okay if the participant are... Uh, they unmute themselves and ask you. Sure, no problem. Okay. I'm okay. But what is this uh, MAPD in the center? Is that the one that's causing the echo? There is, uh, uh, I'm not sure which one is actually causing the echo because I think the participants are also having the same problem. Unless yeah, I think I think the MAPD 2021 is actually uh, yeah. I think now it's okay, right, Doctor? Yes, I can hear. I can All hear. Right. Good. So basically, we have 71 participants now. Mm -hmm. uh, we shall start, shall we start at 1.05? Another two more minutes, Doctor? Sure, no worries at all. All right, all right. thank you, thank okay. you. Okay.
Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our ninth uh, Malaysian Association of Pediatric Dentistry webinar series. I am uh, Dr. Nabila Sawadibinti Harif, and I will serve as your moderator for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, on behalf of uh, Malaysian Association of Pediatric Dentistry, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your support and throughout our webinar series. Uh, before we start, uh, there's a few housekeeping announcements that I would like to make. First, uh, please make sure that you mute your microphones and also to make sure that you switch off your videos throughout our webinars. Uh, secondly, if you have any question, please type at the chat box. Uh, I will try to read it at the end of our webinar sessions, uh, at the end of the presentations. We also will share the link of attendant links uh, in our chat box. And please make sure that you all fill it up before you leave the webinar. And also the certificate will be emailed to you later. And for our webinar today, we have a two platform provide, which are the Google Meet and also our YouTube channel. If you are unable to access through our Google Meet, uh, you are feel free to actually subscribe our YouTube channel, MAPD 2021. So now, shall we start? Uh, today, I'm very honored to uh, introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Yoga Bhavani Shamuganadan. Dr. Yoga is currently practicing in uh, Glen Eagles Medini Johor Bahru as a consultant in pediatric anesthesiologist. Uh, Dr. Yoga obtained her medical degree in Manipal Academy of Higher Education in 1997 and she uh, pursued her study in Master in University of Kebangsa Ad Malaysia and completed her Master in 2007. Uh, she then completed her sub-specialist in Pits and Anesthesiologist in 2014. She's an active member of Malaysian Society of Anesthesiology. Uh, she's a very dedicated to her field and she's very passionate about Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Yoga to deliver her talk on anesthetic consideration of pediatric patient. The floor is yours, Dr. Yoga. Good afternoon. It is indeed a pleasure to share this afternoon with all of you. Uh, thank you to the MAPD Organizing Committee for this invitation, Dr. Nabila, who is a moderator, and the wonderful audience out there this afternoon. Uh, is, is it clear I proceed? Yes, Dr. It's clear. Okay, so um, I would just uh, mention that there are a few areas that I'm going to cover to, and hope to share with all of you during this uh, 40 minute or so webinar. And it might be a bit of a roller coaster, right? Because there are quite a few areas, but we'll breeze through it. And I promise to have a guest star appearance somewhere in the middle of the presentation. So it will be a surprise for you all and just hang in there, okay? So this is the overview. You can just have a brief run through uh, covering about anesthesia, modes and stages, psychological effects and the pre-op preparation for the child environment and the parents. Uh, URTI, which is very uh, dear to us because we, uh, it's very uh, critical if the child is coming in with a URTI. Fasting guidelines, the anesthesiologist and the child awareness. And of course, we can't leave any webinar now without mentioning a new friend around who's going to stay for some time. Okay, so we'll proceed now. What was surgery like before anesthesia? So just a brief run through in history. The fastest surgeon was Robert Liston and he was given the title fastest surgeon because he could just amputate a leg in less than half a minute. But he had an impressive mortality rate of 1 in 10 in those days as compared to his contemporaries. However, he still holds the records up to today as the only surgeon with a 300% mortality. Okay, he lost his patient, his assistant. He accidentally chopped off two fingers during the same surgery. And a bystander, when he lifted his knife and the coat tails accidentally got cut, the bystander actually fainted and died of a heart attack. So there you go, 300% mortality. Patient and assistant died of gangrene subsequently in the ward. 
Now, anesthesia came into the picture around 1846, and uh, it stems from the Greek language, and without an aesthetic sensation. And it appears that dentistry and anesthesia go a way long way back because father of anesthesia was a dentist by the name of William Thomas Green Morton, and dental extraction was performed in 1846 on a music teacher using ether. So ether was the first anesthetic agent. And within uh, less than three weeks, they actually had a public demonstration. As you can see, uh, the apparatus is over there, which was used to provide the ether, not like our fancy GM machines nowadays. A little bit of advertising from my side. What do we do? We actually provide pain relief, acute chronic perioperative. We also cover the pain clinic to see patients with chronic pain. ICU, HDU. We are called upon for resuscitation services. Uh, the birthing mothers to provide them labor epidural and comfort, teaching, training, research, and auditing. Okay, moving on to the modes of anesthesia, general anesthesia, the definition is controlled and reversible state of four categories here, unconsciousness, amnesia, analgesia, with or without paralysis. So general anesthesia can be inhalational or TIVA. TIVA has been around from the 1980s, more used in the adults, but we are also using in pediatric, but it is very dependent upon operator comfort. So it needs to be practiced many times before we can actually do it on the child, but it is being done. Regional anesthesia also in adults and pediatrics, comprising central, peripheral, and continuous. In pediatrics, where we are focused on, we do it for our premature babies before they are discharged by giving them a single shot spinal, or usually via herniotomies before they get discharged. They also get caudal and caudal epidural for certain procedures involving abdomen or uh, hypospadias. Continuous, when the catheter is placed in situ, then it is becoming a con uh, continuous regional anesthesia. The other thing is sedation or monitored anesthetic care. This is provided in the OR setup uh, in the dental clinic as well, as well as the um, remote locations as in MRI suite or in the endoscopy suite, as well as sometimes we are also using for the um, uh, setting of the central lines. When we are called upon to set central lines in the pediatric patient, we do provide some sedation. Local anesthesia and a combination. It can be a combination of either perhaps a regional with sedation or general anesthesia in pediatric, general anesthesia first, followed by the regional. Okay. Now stages in general anesthesia. We have the induction, maintenance and emergence broadly. Within induction phase, we have Four stages, stage three is where we are targeting the surgical anesthesia. And uh, within this stage itself, there are four planes. I will not go into the depth, it's not necessary, but the true uh, anesthesia actually comes within the third plane of stage three, where there is total abdominal and intercostal muscle relaxation and a uh, patient is fit for uh, surgery to proceed, right? Okay, this one is a common uh, statement seen across the pediatric fraternity, whether dentistry, surgical anesthesia. It's not a small adult, we all know, okay? So we need to actually uh, adjust ourselves according to our patients because they vary in their ages and in the stages of brain development. Hence, we, that's why I'm going to touch a little bit, it may be a bit dry, but on the personality and the psychology and the, uh, what do you call it, the anatomy of the child, the pediatric child. So they differ in terms of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology even. So looking at this, we can obviously see the nasopharynx is much smaller. So when they have URTI, there's going to be edema, secretions, and it will affect their anesthetic. Now they have lymphoid tissues, the tonsils and adenoids in the way, most of them. And uh, they also have a large tongue, as we can see, with a smaller oral cavity. You all are experts in this area. And as we progress further, the epiglottis is long, floppy, and narrow in terms of intubation, presents a challenge if you're not familiar. And going further down, if you see the cartilages, they are actually very immature, they're easily collapsible. There's the thyroid, the cricoid, uh, thyroid, cricoid, and the tracheal cartilages. So if you observe, this is the narrowest part below the glottis. Hence, in the newborn or in the very young for intubation purposes, we do not encourage repeated attempts at intubation because just a one millimeter increase in the swelling or in the edema will actually cause a 60% obstruction. And in the newborn, the area, the diameter is only four to five mm. So a one mm makes a lot of difference. Okay, we're moving on to personality. Now, 
as I said, they vary in ages. So we have to know the patients we are seeing in our day-to-day -day practice. So this is the personality uh, theory that have been put forward, and we tend to go by this cognitive theory. Okay, so up to age two years is a sensory motor period. Everything is touch, feel, movement. So the child is still very young, mostly require general anesthesia during this stage. Ages two to four is the preconceptual period. During this time, the child is not able to use logic. They cannot uh, combine or separate ideas. They use objects to actually um, represent what they want to say. For example, the broom, they could represent that to be a horse. So they are quite imaginative during this phase. Now, ages four to seven is intuitive. A lot of questions you need to sit, explain to them, and you can maybe get them over onto your side. A lot of why and how. Ages seven, concrete operational, and adolescents, as we know, we can you know, actually speak to them and make them understand. So these are the various models, just for interest sake. Psychological if hospitalization now landmark articles i'm going to breeze through this otherwise uh, it's quite a bit so there's a landmark article by spitz in 1945 where he studied um, groups of institutionalized infants over their first year of life because in the initial phase a lot of emphasis was placed on medical treatment and the child's psychosocial development was totally ignored so he concluded that a satisfactory mother and child relationship during the first year would prevent irreparable psychiatric consequences deriving from neglect during this period. So the first one year is very important. And it has been found in less than five months, if the child is deprived of a mother-child relationship, it is detrimental overall. Okay, we'll just take a moment here. Some may have experienced general anesthesia, some of us may not have, but just looking uh, at this picture, if we position ourselves on the opposite end, on the receiving end of the mask. I think all of us will feel our heart, you know, you feel a bit of chill for a moment because you feel with anxiety, concern, fear of the unknown, right? So this is what the child or the patient would feel like when they are on the OR table with a whole bunch of strangers with masks and uh, attire just looking down on them. For us, it's a day-to-day -day routine affair, but for the patient, it is um, quite fearful, quite fearsome at times. Okay, so now psychological effects of anesthesia and surgery. The first study was done by Levy in 1945. Here he did a retrospective study, 124 children referred to him for behavioral problems, and these children all had surgery sometime in childhood. And what did he find out? The highest percentage of children was between the ages one to three that demonstrated emotional issues after surgery. In what sense? Prolonged night terrors especially in this age group, one to two, negativism in ages above four and phobias, anxiety in all age groups. His reasoning, why did this happen? Because there was a keener response to pain in this age group. They had poorer understanding as we covered just now, increased dependency on their mothers, decreased experience with social contact outside their home, plus decreased ability to handle anxiety. They just cannot comprehend or process these uh, emotions. Now, Aikenhoff had also done a retrospective study in about 600 over kids. He found 17% incidents of which 40% occurred in the same age group. So this is also attributable. And another study by Both and Galston, what leads to a stormy induction or emergence from anesthesia? He interviewed 50 children, these children between the ages of 4 and 14 for elective surgery. He interviewed them upon admission, prior to induction and after surgery. And he came up with this finding. Interactive children appearing at ease, they experience no perioperative behavioral difficulties. Whereas you've got to be careful when you have the quiet and anxious children because these children are quiet, they don't look at you, they don't want to talk to you, you don't know what's brewing in their heads. And they were found to have a stormy anesthetic induction. That's when they start to throw a tantrum or scream or you know, they feel terrorized. And also during emergence from anesthesia. So be cautious and be careful when we have a quiet child. Vetter in 1993 also predicted the same. So a dependent and withdrawn effect, effect means a personality preoperatively, history of previous surgery and not familiarized or taking a family tour or being you know, counseled. These ages also found to have a stormy induction. Now, how do kids cope? We have the active coping kit, talks a lot, asks a lot of questions and benefits from 
telling him what's going to happen to him and you have the opposite end, the silent child who's not interested and you tell him he gets more withdrawn within his shell. So these kids may actually, um, we may want to think of giving them an anxiolytic, which we often do in the holding baby before we take them in to calm them down. It helps the child as well as the parents. So in summary, with regards to the personality and psychology, it is found that the younger children are at greater risk of experiencing a turbulent antic induction and adverse behavioral sequelae. So others at risk would be the quiet and negative children, children with previous history of hospital experience and surgeries with a stormy induction, and those who have not had psychological preparation. So, so far, I hope it's clear, a bit dry, but I'm sure being in the pediatric circle, we quite understand this. Now, how do we pre operatively prepare psychologically? So basically the child, we need to talk to them and we can win them over, that would be great. So three things, the environment, the parents and the child, because this child is going to come with a package. The parent is always going to be there, one or two. So we prepare the environment. Children ideally should be managed in a separate setup away from the adults. So most of the pediatric dental facilities do have a separate section where it's decorated, it's uh, attractive and stickers and toys and things like that. So that's good. And the theater design and aesthetic recovery areas, um, unfortunately, that's not really picked up well here. Uh, perhaps with the Women and Children's Hospital, we have a better option of doing that, but not in the general setup. Okay, this is uh, just an example, like a Goldilocks chair. You can see this is uh, in Singapore where I had worked before in the children's hospital. So the child walks in and you even have a PC there for them to play. So it doesn't even feel like a hospital. And this is how the other end of the room with books for the child who likes to read. And this dental chair, I think any child would want to hop in and get it done. Okay, so coming to parents, I'm breezing through, I hope so far um, it's okay. And uh, if you need me to slow down, just let me know, okay? So this is prepare the parents. Now Melish in 1969 discovered being unable to choose parents for your patients, you must make do with those who come with the child. This is reassuring for us because it would be abnormal if they showed no anxiety. Okay. Now, how do you deal with the parents? Simple. Most of us are parents. Those who are not, we can, you know, uh, get the wind of it. You need to have genuine warmth because the parents can sense if you are um, nervous or if you are not friendly, you know. So empathy, understanding, okay, just project that. And a good preparation of the parent reduces the parental anxiety, which helps the child because an anxious parent is going to reflect onto the child. Even parents of children with only minor problems may be very anxious. So explanations, communication and answering whatever um, questions or doubts they have will actually go a long way. Now, the parents will actually benefit from our side discussion of the risk of anesthesia. They like to be listened to, so answer every question they have, allow time for discussion, for questions, and they will want to actually project their concerns and ideas because they know the child best. So one common thing that from anesthesia side that we find is that they like to ask about the impact or the effect of anesthesia on the growing brain. This is a favorite question among parents. And to help us, FDA in 2016 issued a black box warning on the use of anesthetics and sedatives in young children to suggest that they may be associated with adverse neurocognitive outcomes. So we have to actually allay their anxiety and we allay their anxiety evidence-based. Okay, so there have been landmark trials, the GAS trial, PANDA, and the MAS studies. These three trials were conducted. And in 2019, it was published that there is no evidence of clinical anesthetic neurotoxicity. So the quote is, the comfortable truth is the likelihood that developmental anesthesia neurotoxicity may not exist in routine surgical procedures that occur in early life. So there have been no recommended changes in our practice of anesthesia towards the little ones. Okay, so it has been found that below the ages of three, which is where their main concern is, short periods as in one to two hours of general anesthesia does not cause any issue or any um, neuro apoptosis or death of neurons. However, if you have a patient that is um, having some underlying congenital problem, presenting recurrently for anesthesia for long hours, that may have an effect and impact. But most of the times we are seeing patients just for one sitting. Now, these are the landmark trials, just for your uh, information, the gas, the panda, and the mask, okay? 
that's the one, the literature. And now parental presence. We have the parents join the patient because it helps us in a great deal. The child is more calm and comfortable. So it's actually very helpful in a child with special needs. But you've got to be careful. If you have an over-anxious parent, sometimes I do send them out of the OR because it is more troublesome and it's not good because it rubs off on the child. So it is up to your discretion. But 99% we let the uh, parent in with the child. Okay, and this line always works. You just say we will take very good care and with your child all the time. They need to hear this. So in the dental clinic, I think it's okay because they are watching every move. But in the OT, when they come in, then they need to take leave once the child goes uh, falls asleep. Okay, so now we move on to the fasting guidelines. What are the aims of the fasting guideline? We want to reduce the risk of pulmonary aspiration because um, usually if it is clear fluid that is aspirated, it is less risky than particulate or solid. So we want to make sure there is adequate time of fasting to avoid these issues. Reduce the patient irritability. As we know, a hungry child is an angry child and sometimes parents also start working up. Okay, And you improve the parental satisfaction and minimize severe hypotension during induction because during general anesthesia, the blood pressure and the vital signs tend to go a little bit down um, with our anesthetic agents. So if the patient is under volume, number one, it may be difficult to get lines. Number two, they may experience some hypotension post-induction and reduce the incidence of hypoglycemia as well. So common regimen solids, which includes Milo, formula milk is six hours, breast fed patients four hours, um, dental side, I don't think that's an issue much unless it is trauma to the soft tissue because there's no teeth during that time. Then clear fluids, two hours we encourage prior to coming to the OT. So some institutions practice four hours for solids, but the, the standard guideline is six hours. Now, elective surgery and URTI. So this is um, always an issue, and I'm sure it's also an issue with the surgeons, all surgeons, adult and pediatric, because um, they're not sure whether to present the child for surgery, book the child for electives or not. So in any case, always it is all right. We are most welcome to check with the anesthetist to uh, make an assessment before we book the child for the surgery. So part of the controversy surrounding this is due to the problem of defining. Now, how do you define? URTI is so vast. It is like, um, well, a child gets it six to eight times a year and 95% of the time is viral. So um, what do we do? Why is this so important? Okay, PRAE is perioperative respiratory adverse event. So URTI may look simple, a runny nose here and there, maybe a cough, a slight fever. But however, these are the issues that can occur, which is why we always take a high risk consent because laryngospasm, bronchospasm to start off and then a rapid drop, they desaturate very fast, breath holding, coughing, then you have a collapse of the lung, alveolus, causing atelectasis. Then if this doesn't resolve, it becomes long-term, stormy. You can get pneumonia in the ICU and unplanned ICU hospital admission in the case of, say, maybe a day surgery patient being converted to hospital admission. So this whole lot of things make us very cautious and very particular about the upper respiratory tract infection. Okay. Uh, Stuff shown, huh? just to give you a little bit of information. History of URTI within two weeks prior to surgery causes a three and a half fold increase in prey or perioperative respiratory adverse events. The major cause of perioperative morbidity and 30% of perioperative cardiac arrest in children. So this is in collaboration with 62 medical centers. So if we can avoid it in the elective surgery, we will do so. But in the emergency, then we need to actually assess and figure out and take a high risk consent and proceed. So the decision to proceed, cancel or postpone? Well, a systemically well child with minimal symptoms may proceed, whereas in an elective procedure in a sick child, please, we will cancel. Intermediate group is where the dilemma is, what to do. So and if we postpone, how long? Usually, these symptoms resolve by two weeks, but altered airway reactivity within the child can continue up to eight weeks following the infection, viral, bacterial, whatever. And there is no consensus to rescheduling. So it's on a case-to-case -case basis, but we have to remember that the risk of prey remains increased up to four weeks following day one of URTI. 
So this table actually is very helpful. May not, uh, maybe you can zoom in on it, but it's available online too. So a child with RT symptoms, if it is urgent, yeah, you will proceed. But if it is not urgent, consider, is it infectious in etiology? Because sometimes they may have adenoids or tonsillitis. Um, sorry, tonsillitis. Tonsillitis can present with recurrent infections, but adenoids or allergic rhinitis is going to be a day, uh, day to day event. So it's going, you're going to forever postpone. So we're not, we've got to get a clear history. Okay, and going down the flow chart, if it is non infectious, then we proceed. And if it is infectious, we see the symptoms, severe or not. So if it is severe, you postpone the surgery because this is elective. If it is not, or there's a reason, consider whether the child is going for general anesthesia. If yes, there are a whole bunch of risk factors to go into and ask the parent and uh, examine the patient. So that is why if there's always a doubt, it is okay to always get anesthetist to check in to the patient. Okay, And then we have our management where we would try to avoid ETT or you know use the LMA or sedate or basically try to avoid stimulating the airway if we can. But if there is more risk than benefit, we would obviously want to postpone at least minimum of two weeks. Now moving on to the anesthesiologist and the child. Okay, uh, I hope it doesn't sound a bit selfish. I'm supposed to be talking to the uh, pediatric dentist, but uh, this is from the induction period is particularly recognized to have psychological trauma. Understand the studies done before. So studies have shown that anesthesiologists they vary in the ability to relate to children and minimize this. So this is also similar because pediatric dentists you are working with the children and. Similarly, like us, you have learned to adjust and empathize with the child. And uh, obviously, this is a, a, a trait that is across the board. So the tips in preparing the little ones. Number one, establishing a rapport. Try to meet the young child with the parents so the child can see you accepting the parents and slowly accept you as well. Come down to the level of the child. Talk to the child in simple terms that the child can understand and pay special attention. Remember the silent child. We may want to use pre-medication for this child. Okay. Here is a video I would just like to share with you where I worked before. You just look at the murals on the wall. This is a children's hospital, so obviously I guess they have the uh, luxury of having this. So the child is being taken in with the father walking in front. He's not clingy and he's very comfortable. Okay. Now, less than nine months, you don't really need the parent to come in. You can do the pre-operative assessment. And I mean, this is with regards to anesthesia because... In the dental clinic, you're not getting, I believe, children below nine months. Hence, surrogates are acceptable and uh, you don't need the parents to come in. So this is one of my colleagues. Well, that's me in the further end there. We normally whisk the child away and have a good time with the baby, actually. So they, we make very good mummies to the babies in the waiting time. Okay. Neonate, they have no stranger anxiety, at least up to four to six months. Uh, maybe four months, I should say. Six months now, they are quite intelligent. They can recognize. So there's no benefit in the parental presence, actually. But for the induction of the older child, it is definitely better to have them in at your discretion. Because if the parent is going to be crying and getting stressed, better to have the parent out. Then three years, they are well bonded to the parents. So they are quite clingy and they cannot understand even if you explain to them. And a higher risk here, as we have seen, stormy induction. And more, we are worried more about the post-op emotional reactions. We don't want to traumatize. We want the child to go under smooth and less crying, less secretions. You know, So it helps them during and also post. So I'm going to show you a few pictures. We act a little bit um, kiddish as well. We bring out the child in us. So the child is happy. The mom is happy. We blow the bubbles, cooperating, breathing, and fall asleep soon. There you go again. Okay. So it takes time. We must understand it takes time. We have to have the patience. Now, three to six years, explanations are important. They are more concerned with bodily integrity. They need to be reassured. They may ask you repeatedly sometimes. And remember that this age group, they can actually um, fairly understand a bit of uh, uh, the, um, ideas, but perhaps they cannot put them, assimilate or put them together. So pre-operational thinking is very literal. So here is again another short video. I just want you to uh, observe the look on the parent's face and the look on the child. It's a look of apprehension. Okay. Now, as we just view this.
you can see she's assessing the person who is talking to her. She's not yet confident, but she's thinking. She's thinking whether to accept or not. And this shows that half the battle is won, okay, at this point. Father is happy, child's okay. Okay, she's trying to say jarum, but it sounds like jagum because she has no teeth. Okay, now you can see father is happy, child is happy, and Anastasia is also happy. And father is at the foot end, she's literally in our hands, okay? So it doesn't happen always, but if it happens, it's lucky. So this should be our aim, you know, to win the child over. Now, 7 to 12 years old is concrete operations and more independent. They are school age going children, less upset by separation. They are more concerned with the procedure and they have wild ideas and misconception. So, but they are discussable. You can discuss with this age group. And adolescent, they are more aware of their body and you must provide information. They are worried about exposure, loss of control, waking up, pain, awareness, okay? Okay, moving on to awareness. Now, awareness is very important. It's something that's overlooked. It can be explicit, implicit. Now, what's the difference? Explicit recall of events is actually they can relate back the exact um, conversation and uh, sounds heard, and they can actually verbalize and tell the anesthetist post-operatively what happened. Whereas implicit is they cannot express it. It is without ex that's why it said uh, implicit, but it is memory without recall. You can retrieve by hypnosis or it may present in dreams and can lead to post-traumatic stress disorders. So explicit memory in a child. The child needs to be at least three years. It is not developed until the child is three because of these various facts. All right. So um, doesn't mean that we ignore because the child can be traumatized by dreams. Okay. A child who described true awareness is not very upset by this and they seldom volunteer because they probably think that people don't believe them or it's a make-believe. And adults, they suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Just on this sentence here, I'd just like to share with you that two weeks ago, I had a patient. In all my years of practice, I've not had a patient come back and tell me about this, but this patient had a surgery done uh, five years ago in another hospital, an adult. And she, the first thing when I asked her, do you have any medical problems that I should know? But she kept on wanting to tell me that, look, I had this uh, recall during surgery and before five years ago. And it was um, so clear. She said she could feel the three incisions as they were going into her thyroid. And uh, someone mentioning that patient is moving and then she fell asleep. So I asked her how long it took for her to get over this. She said about five months. Uh, whether she was counseled and given a post-operative counseling, she said yes. So this is very important. So you will, uh, in children, you need to actually find out post-operatively and it is real. If you do not dig, you will not find it in the older child. I will share a video on this. Incidence of awareness. In the pediatric, it's about 0 0.8 to 1.2. In the adult, it's higher in these cases because in these cases, inevitably, the anesthetic concentration of drugs is, uh, sorry, the anesthetic concentration of drugs is modified in the obstetrics for obvious reasons in the cardiac patient because of poor cardiac function and in trauma patients because they will be hypovolemic and bleeding. So there's a higher chance and higher risk of awareness. What kind of awareness? Auditory, visual, sensory perception or they could even feel the pain okay they should not but sometimes they do paralysis they can't move and of course anxiety when all these things happen now this video is in another language but you can just read the subtitles Sorry, Doctor. I think the video stuck. Oh, is it on my side? Is it moving? Hang on, yeah. Moving from ours. Oh yeah. Okay, I think I will skip that because I think time is running out. But in this uh, video, this boy is actually mentioning about he had a surgery behind the ear and he could feel the clamp. He could hear people talking, and after the surgery, he was reluctant to actually uh, talk about it. But he did tell his mom. He did say that. Probably people will not believe me, but in the end, when the anesthetist went to speak to him, he mentioned uh, what happened and people believed him and he made a difference for him. So
So uh, he was counseled accordingly. All right, I'm sorry about that slip up on that video. Um, these are the studies done. And uh, when is the best time to ask? Well, the recall can be delayed for days or weeks. So multiple interviews are recommended. Okay. Medical legal implications and close claims project in the ASA, American Society of Anesthesiologists, two percent of all claims constitute this unawareness. Okay, so why does this happen? No or light anesthetic is given on purpose, like in cases mentioned just now, insufficient dose, inadvertently, or equipment malfunction or the anesthetist error. Okay, I'll skip this. Okay, that's um. So it's a responsibility of the anesthesia provider to ensure that these doses are delivered without interruption for the time that they are needed. And now moving on to quickly anesthesia for pediatric dentistry, which you all are more familiar than me, local anesthesia, dental chair sedation, general anesthesia. So which to choose based on cognitive development of the child, medical status of the child, complexity of the procedure. LA, you are the experts in this. And if there's local infection, probably it cannot be done. It will not be effective. And uh, it's common for children to refuse. Now, why do they refuse? Because of various reasons, fear, anxiety, and obstinacy, or lack of understanding, and their belief that it is not needed. So what's important? Okay, This is, first, do no harm, act in the best interest of the child, and respect the child's right to refuse. So I want you to take a, um, this is where the appearance of our guest star comes in. So this is actually uh, just observe uh, the what you call this the body language of the patient, and uh, maybe take a look at the glasses. The glasses are pink, if you notice. All right. Later, I will bring to your notice. So just look at the body language. The child is obviously not comfortable, starting to want to ask questions, and um, I will move on. I will skip that. So okay, this is another video. Webash. This is in the age group of six, talking to our guest star. I'm sure he's known to all of you. So he's asking some questions that he's answering patiently. And you will see by the end of this video, that um, actually just got the drapes on and sit with the procedure. And uh, I'll briefly play this. I won't go through the whole thing. Uh, are you all seeing it sideways? Because it was supposed to have. Okay. Yeah, it is sideways, doctor. Okay, please notice huh, this is a blue pair of glasses. The earlier one was pink. And watch the skill with how Dr. Ridwan brings in the LA syringe. And it's amazing the patient does not even flinch. Okay, I'm going to skip that. I mean, it's a bit slightly longer than that. So what I'm trying to say here is, in the first picture, there was a pink pair of glasses, which means in the first round, even though the drape was applied, the procedure was not done because the child was not ready. So it was rescheduled. So this is where uh, the previous slide where the child's refusal and uh, takes time. So this is proof of it. And you cannot get a child to give you a thumbs up. So it definitely must have been a good experience for her. Thanks to Dr. Ridwan. It was done with his permission and that daughter is my, and the child is my daughter. So um, it was a wonderful experience for her. Now, dental chair sedation. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence defines three levels, minimal, moderate, and deep. And the aims of the sedation, the goal here is to reduce the fear and anxiety of the child, augment pain control, and minimize movement. This, I'm sure, it's available online, which is where I got it from. So these are the various features of minimal, what to expect on the airway, ventilatory, and cardiovascular function. Okay, you can look this up anytime. Now, criteria, careful pre-sedation evaluation only for ASA 1 and 2. You must have a responsible escort. Facilities must be good and supportive. Medication, rescue, drugs, and equipment. Soap me is a mnemonic for your um, suction apparatus, oxygen, airway, pharmacology, your drugs, rescue drugs, your machines that are required and uh, equipment that's necessary. 
Documentation is important, informed consent, instruction information, fasting guidelines, medications, uh, effects and interactions, appropriately trained staff is very important huh? because you are in a setup where the child can actually slip into deeper levels of sedation, monitoring, properly equipped recovery area and discharge instructions. Now, two individuals must be present throughout and uh, it is encouraged and it is in fact um, advocated that they should have now two, both should have the APLS. Previously, it used to be just one, but if I'm not mistaken now, it's both should have this and it should be consisting of independent observer and the practitioner. So the independent observer's role is uh, to actually observe the child, the patency of the airway, to rescue breathing, to monitor vital signs. So totally independent, not involved in the procedure per se. Indications for general anesthesia when LA has failed, uncooperative patient, psychological disorder. Now, venue and facilities for GA in pediatric dentistry only in a hospital setting where you have resuscitative equipment, anesthetic facilities, standard preoperative monitoring, trained personnel, okay, and supporting staff. Say if there's a case where the child collapses, you may need the ICU facility as well. Okay, these are the guidelines that I have um, taken from. I'll probably skip this slide because this basically regards to the oral health related quality of life. Okay, so I'll just. You can just read it as it comes out because I think we're running out of time. So, but they have found now what is interesting here very young children under GA found to exhibit positive behavior at sequent recall appointments than those treated under conscious sedation. So, I guess um, if they had a good experience, then they would be more um, uh, amenable to the next visit. Uh, now, as uh, we're coming towards the end, the ASA and the APSF joint statement on elective surgery is very recent in December last year with regards to COVID-19 infection, okay, because now we have a shared airway, not just between the dentist and the anesthetist, but also corona decides to sit in there. So COVID-19 patients should delay surgery. This is from October 2020, published in Anesthesia, done, conducted in 116 countries, out of which Malaysia is one of them, comprising of more than 25,000 surgeons and this number of patients and this number of hospitals. Within six weeks of a diagnosed COVID-19 infection, post-op mortality has been found to be up to 4%, two and a half times more likely to die after the operation. So this has been brought out in a joint statement by the College of Surgeons, AMM and University of Birmingham. So when's the best timing? Based on severity and symptoms. Four weeks for asymptomatic or those recovering from mild non-respiratory symptoms, six weeks for those without hospitalization with symptoms, eight to 10 for symptomatic patient who are immunocompromised, diabetic, or hospitalized, and those who have been in the ICU will need at least 12 weeks duration. Adjusted 30-day mortality in a non-SARS-CoV-2 patient, sorry, is 1.5%. Uh, so post-SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis, mortality is 4%, and uh, three to four weeks, this is if they're coming in after the SARS-CoV-2 infection, these are the mortality rates. So you delay ideally seven weeks or more, but yet if they come in with ongoing symptoms if the surgery has to be done, then mortality rate is high at 6%. And if they are asymptomatic, it's better, it's 1.3, which is almost there, okay? Okay, so I'm at the end, thank you for the presentation. I hope it has been interesting and informative. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoga. Thank you for a very informative, interesting, and very comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, I think we got one question from the participants. It's from Dr. Muhammad Rizwan Muhammad Razi. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I would like to ask your opinion on IV ketamine versus midazolam sedation. What is your opinion, Dr. Yoga, about it? Okay, uh, based on the medical status of the condition, IV ketamine is very, very good because it is field anesthesia. We can use it in various setups. If child is able to protect the airway, but however, what I tend to do is, uh, with, ketamine is known for its uh, hallucinations, as we all know. So uh, what I tend to do is give 0 0.05 milligram per kilo of midazolam to counter the hallucination and the dream effect. But as in all sedations, you do need um, monitoring of SpO2 and things like that. Because midazolam per se, the child can react either way. You can have some disinhibition or uh, they can actually, uh, you know, not they, they they may get too deeply sedated if you're given a little bit higher than you need to support the airway. So ketamine is fairly safe, but with a little bit of meter, which uh, is what we normally practice to counter. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, ah. Okay. 
I also okay. have one question for you, also, Doctor. The sure. most common uh, uh, question from the parents is that about the neurotoxicity uh, effects of children when we give in a general anesthesia. Yes. How do you convince the parents about this? Okay, most of the parents that we are seeing, or most of the patients rather that we are seeing, are, are, are patients that are actually coming in for a single sitting. Or even if they have coming for, for another sitting, it probably be way down the line, maybe a hernia and then a tonsillectomy. It really, you get them very often. So children, normally what I tell them is less than uh, two hours, a child below three years, studies have shown, and I will quote them these studies, I mean, not the details, of course, but studies in recently have shown that uh, there is no change recommended to our anesthetic practice and there is no um, significant uh, effect on the development of the pediatric brain in that age group. And they are usually okay with it. But patients, Patients who are chronically ill that are coming in repeatedly, normally parents are already so concerned about the general progress of the child and whether they're going to come out of that illness. So this becomes secondary and they do need the surgery to go on and, uh, you know, repeated recurrent long hours of surgery or anesthesia, those who are ventilated in the ICU. So that's different. But this one-off is actually very safe. There's no need to worry. Yeah, because it's evidence-based. I mean, we're not saying there's anecdotal. I see. Yeah, sometimes it's very difficult to actually convince the parents. Yes, that is their that is their utmost question in the front of their mind, you know. Yeah, will it affect, yes, will they wake up? Will it affect the development? It's true. Another question from Dr. Masniza Jamian. Hi doctor, thank you for your talk. May I know why nitrous oxide chosen as induction only on certain children? Okay, maybe you're referring to inhalational. Now, for inhalational induction, so induction can be IV or inhalational. So inhalational, when you give nitrous, there is a second gas effect for the sleeveoflurane to get in faster. It's called second gas effect. So this is very useful because if you just give oxygen and SIBO, it will, it will take a longer time. However, there are certain patients, for example, hole in the heart patient, ASD, VSD, nitrous oxide is a no-no because it is bubble forming. You don't want bubbles to form and get an embolism. So also in patients who have got some kind of obstruction, like intestinal obstruction, you don't want to use nitrous oxide. So you need to tailor according to the patient and the condition. So in a healthy child, nitrous oxide is chosen along with oxygen and CO because of the second gas effect, whereby the child goes under much faster. And then you turn off the nitrous oxide and leave the sevoflurane and the oxygen on. Was it too fast, uh, the presentation, or was it... Uh... It's okay, Doctor, it's okay. Okay, because I think I've taken a lot of time. And, yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, uh, this one, oh, Masmina said, oh, this is Tawa Mala. It's one of our uh, pits dentist specialists in Malacca. She's the one who asked the question about... Oh, the, okay. Hi, uh, Tawa Mala. I worked, worked in, in Malacca. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. There's a, uh, her question is on the nitrous oxide as an induction. Right. Okay, Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very great pleasure and it's an honor to have you here. Uh, thank you for your sharing, especially to have someone from the other uh, specialty to join us. And also, uh, it's a very excellent talk also. Uh, for all the participants, uh, I would like to remind you to fill up the form, attendance forms. They already give it in the uh, chat box. Uh, feel free to actually uh, fill up the forms. And also to other members, uh, I would like to encourage you to join us as a, a member of a Malaysian Association of Pediatric Dentistry. Please uh, like, share, follow. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. that's another question. Uh, sorry, doctor. Oh, in fact, there's a some question coming in. I'm sorry, doctor. Is it okay for you to answer the question? I'm I'm fine. I'm okay. No worries. Okay. Not at all. Uh, it's, okay. it's from JCLA. Hi, doctor. Is the fasting regime the same for sedation as for general anesthesia? Okay. Um, we do encourage on our side when we get patients for sedation, we prefer them to be fasted, especially for elective cases, uh, following the regimen that I showed earlier, 6, 4, and 2. Because uh, in case of trauma and all that, the gastric emptying time is much delayed. So then we would actually see whether to proceed with sedation or intubate because priority is... Uh, the, uh, we want to avoid pulmonary aspiration of the gastric content. So it's better to be safe than sorry. So we would still go by uh, from our side. Uh, we would take six hours for solids, which includes Milo and stuff like that. Whereas uh, clear fluids, we would allow anything that is non-particulate, as in Ribena, without the 
uh, fruit juices without the pulp. So uh, that's, that, that holds true for both. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Doctor. There's another question also. Will it be better to have multiple short GA session versus a single longer GA session in a child needing multiple surgeries? Well, from uh, Dr. DC. Okay, uh, multiple uh, surgery is not, <laughs> it's not like haircut where we go in as we like and change the shape. So actually, when, if surgery is warranted for that particular condition and the child has to come in, then anesthesia is provided accordingly. Uh, we actually go by uh, how the child progresses in the medical condition or surgical condition per se. So it, it is not really um, proper for me to say to come in at one go and complete everything because some surgeries require a few sittings and they will need to come in. I see. I hope Another that question from, the, from Dr. Saw, Doctor. Yes. How soon after post-op can we allow a child orally? Do we have to wait for four hours even for clear fluid? Not at all. In fact, uh, my patients with hernia and hydrocele, anything not related to bowel anastomosis, nothing to do with bowel surgery, I even allow the mother to feed in the recovery because the child wakes up cranky and hungry and most of the time is crying not from pain because from hunger. So anything that is not related to GIT where you're not worried about uh, anastomotic leak or stuff like that, milk straight away as long as the child is fully awake. Drowsy, please don't because might aspirate. Fully awake, crying for milk, can go ahead feeding and I do it in the recovery itself. I get the mom or dad so to get the milk. Do you normally like gradually start with the clear fluid first and then with the fluid nourishing or you straight away ask the patient to have their milk after, uh, the, the, in, after, the, after the surgery? Okay, uh, do, the infants and those who are bottle fed or breastfed, I go straight away back to milk. But the older children, because this is where the post-operative nausea, it is rarer in children below five. But children five and above, normally I give them antiemetic because it has been proven that these children are more prone to anesthetic nausea and vomiting. So these kids, I will tell the parent, maybe give a bit of water. If they don't throw up, then you proceed with whatever they want. Because these children are older, they can tolerate that hunger by the time they go back. But the below five can go straight on to milk, no issues at all. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay um, and la uh, one last question for me, doctor. What, uh, what is your opinion about chlorohydrate? Chlorohydrate, I must say that uh, it is very touch and go. I personally have not used it because the medical side usually uses a lot of it. But personal experience is my own daughter who was in the video earlier with Dr. Ridwan. Two, two doses of chlorohydrate were required for her before her, her imaging procedure and she never slept. It was ridiculous. She never slept. And my concern as an anesthetist was her stomach is full. So what if she sleeps and then, you know, she throws up. So uh, I, that one um, anesthetist, actually, we do not use chlorohydrate. So um, more of Pete's medical, but even then, I think probably they are also moving away. Um, I need to discuss with my Pete's colleague about that because they are quite used to it. And they, they, I believe they still do use it on and off occasionally. But anesthetics-wise, we don't. Even pethidine, we have moved away from pethidine. Yeah. I see. Okay. There's one, it's not, uh, this is another question. Are you okay to answer the question, doctor? I'm, I'm free, no worries. I, I love it because I love the pediatric dentist. By the way, uh, can I just uh, make a small confession here? I must always say that... Okay. Um, I have enjoyed, it has always been a joy working with pediatric dentists because their level of care and dedication uh, is so genuine and it never fails to amaze me. You know, after the induction, I mean, after the surgery, when you look up, you will see inevitably their patient is sitting in some corner of the OR waiting for our patient to actually come around from anesthesia and surgery. You don't see this much with other surgeons. I mean, I don't know, it's a, it's a trademark and I mean it, I like it and I, and I appreciate it and it's really wonderful because no matter what you look up, it's somewhere there in the OR with you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you okay. so much, brother. I feel like I'm blush. <laughs> Thank you so much for the compliment for us. Uh, the question is, if you don't mind on your own opinion, what are the chances of a child having tracheal stenosis after general anesthesia in a child? Tracheal stenosis is not common unless um, the child is ventilated post-operatively in the ICU for a long time on an inappropriately sized tube, uh, normally that causes tracheal stenosis. Otherwise what, otherwise, what they can have actually is a mucosal edema, tracheal mucosal edema. If the tube is too tight or the cuff is inflated without checking the cuff pressure, that's very important because as we saw in the figure, 
the area below at the cricoid level is really narrow. So if you do not have the appropriate size tube, it can cause um, some amount of uh, damage to the trachea mucosa. And uh, inevitably during intubation, when you're intubating a child, never force a tube in, which is what we are taught and we teach our trainees also. Because the minute you feel the slightest resistance, the tendency sometimes is to know, I'll just push it in because it will anyway open up. Yeah, but you're going to tear and cause a lot of damage along the way because it's narrower down there. So what you do is you go scale down the size of the ETT. So tracheal stenosis normally is a problem when it is a child is ventilated for a long time. So we have a gauge to measure the cuff pressure, which we do on each shift in the ICU. The nurses are trained to check the cuff pressure. And it's always better to have a little bit of leak rather than a fully inflated cuff. But in case of dental surgery, we will put a throat pack and we prefer a good seal because we don't want the debris to go down. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoga. Uh, you, Dr. My, my presidents of MABD, Dr. Joanna, and also my committee and all the participants would like to thank you so much for a very excellent talk, Dr. It's a very informative, comprehensive and also you really open a, uh, a different horizon for us to see on your part. So thank yeah. you very much. I hope you don't Look. mind if I invite you again for another talk. Not at all, no worries. Uh, my video is not there, is it? Oops. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, not at all. I'm very happy to have given this talk. I just hope that I wasn't rushing through because there are a few areas that were important that I wanted to cover. So um, I hope you, you there's some take home points from this and uh, Hopefully, yeah, we can meet in the future again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. From okay. MBD itself, I would like to thank you again. So, uh, not to forget, I also would like to invite all of you to join for our uh, October webinar, which will be held in uh, 3rd of November. Uh, the talk is, uh, the moderator will be by Dr. Joanna. And also, the talk will be given by uh, our pediatric respiratory physician on the topic long-term non-invasive ventilation in children. Please do join us uh, on Wednesday, 3rd of November, 2021, and again at our lunch hour, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. So uh, thank you very much. Very looking forward for all of you to join us. And um, till then, thank you very much.